Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rebecca Epstein. We're just going to get started momentarily, give people a minute or two to log on. I know that with various security settings, I um, take it takes my computer a little bit longer to log on to these webinars these days. All right, it looks like we're achieving a critical mass, so I think we can go ahead and begin. Welcome everyone. Again, my name is Rebecca Epstein. I'm a program manager at the Institute for Public Health Innovation and manager of Virginia's new statewide immunization coalition we are launching today called Immunize VA. We're so excited to share the presentations that we have planned for you today. We have a really exciting lineup. We'll start with a speaker who can talk about the national landscape for immunization coalitions across the country. We'll move next to a more statewide perspective of immunizations across the Commonwealth. And I'll end the webinar by talking a bit more about Immunize VA and our plans for the coalition moving forward. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. Everybody is automatically on mute. Um, please feel free to use the chat function to let us know if you are having any difficulties hearing us. Um, additionally, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit them via chat. We will have someone monitoring the chat box and designated times after each presentation to, for a little Q&A with each presenter. Um, we also encourage you to dial in with your phone if you are having a hard time hearing the webinar through your computer. I will we'll go ahead and, and get started with our first presenter. I'm so excited to introduce, and I think it's almost a blessing in disguise that our initial in-person meeting was postponed because it allows us to have speakers on this web version of our launch coming all the way from Minnesota that we might not have otherwise been able to include in our launch. Um, so our first speaker comes from the Immunization Action Coalition. Dr. Deborah Wexler is the founder and executive director of the Immunization Action Coalition, the nation's largest nonprofit immunization education and advocacy organization located in St. Paul, Minnesota. IAC has partnered with and received continuous funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention since 1995. Dr. Wexler serves as a consultant to a range of national immunization organizations, both the in both the public and private spheres. She is the recipient of several prestigious awards, including recognition from CDC, Every Child by Two, Vaccinate Your Family, and the American Pharmacists Association. Deborah continues to provide innovative leadership to the national immunization community on critical issues, including effective communication of the power of vaccines, advocacy for improved vaccine policies, and increasing coverage rates across the age span through provider education. We are so fortunate to have her on the webinar with us today. And with that, I will pass the proverbial mic to Dr. Wexler while I get her presentation up and running. Uh, 
am I unmuted now? We can hear you. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm so delighted to be here today for your opening about the Virginia Immunization Coalition. So thanks for having me from Minnesota. Um, I'll wait for the slides to pop up. I'm not seeing them yet. Okay. So, so I'm here to talk about the landscape of immunization coalitions. I've been involved with them since 1990s. Uh, and let's talk about that. Next slide, Rebecca. Thank you to Lisa Jacques, who is our uh, project manager for the Immunization Coalitions Network, our national network. Next slide. So I'd like to talk about the roots of IAC because we were a coalition when we started in 1990. Um, this was our website, by the way, in 1996. But we started as a, a grassroots St. Paul coalition to get Hmong children vaccinated against hepatitis B. These were new refugee children from Southeast Asia. Um, our coalition partners were local public health, the state health department, clinics, and um, you know pr private providers. Um, but just when we got going on reaching out to the community, measles struck the nation and it struck St. Paul particularly hard. We had three Hmong children die from measles all around the same date, May 1st, um, 1990, and um, one-year-olds and uh, all died of measles. So our work was cut out for us. Not only were we working on Hep B vaccine, but all vaccine preventable diseases. So this was our website, which started in 1996. Batman and Robin up in the corner were our logo because my son loved bat drawing Batman and Robin. Uh, next slide, please. This is our website today. Um, I'm gonna tell you about IAC today because we support coalitions in so many ways. And I want you to know what our main website is. It was started back in 96. Um, this is our home page. It's a great URL, immunize.org. So we're happy with having that. Um, our mission is to increase immunization rates across the age span. We became a 501c3 organization in 1994, um, and um, we've spent 30 years providing educational materials for uh, providers and also for patients. And we also have advocacy materials to help educate legislators and policymakers. So we work across all spheres of immunization stakeholders. Um, we work on um, behind besides educating health professionals and the public we work with advocates and we work behind the scenes on state immunization policy so we work with states to help them achieve their goals with immunization stopping detrimental legislation and we collaborate with partners across the nation next slide we can skip these two slides because i just said that i just talked my way through this so next slide this is our team. We have 30 plus people who work at IAC and we're very happy to have them. Six are employees, 24 are consultants. Many of them have worked for state health departments, have worked for CDC, and they provide collectively over several hundred years of immunization expertise in their fields. Next slide. One takeaway, my major takeaway today is I hope you will subscribe to IAC Express. This is our weekly email news service. It goes out to 52,000 subscribers free every Wednesday morning, and it tells you what's practical in the field of immunization. You know, it's not the research, it's not, it, it is what the front line needs to know about immunization, new vaccine information statements, uh, ACIP recommendations. So I hope you'll all subscribe. We have 10 dedicated staff members who work every day on this publication. Next slide. And it's very simple to subscribe. Just go to immunize.org slash subscribe and fill out this simple form. Next slide. And you can skip that one because I just talked my way through that. Okay, now popular, this is what's popular on immunize.org and you should all know about it. And you know, that's what, sorry to talk about IEC, but you really need to know this. So we are the biggest website in the nation on immunization education. We have 9 million visits a year on our website. We have 25,000 visitors a day on our website. Why do they come to our website? 
Uh, number one, they come for what we call handouts. These are our educational materials. We have more than 300 of them on our website, some in many languages. These are ready to go PDFs that you can download, give to patients, uh, some in several languages. And uh, they're for health professionals to educate them about techniques and all of those materials. And then also for the public, so handouts. The other next is VIS translations. So we're funded by CDC to provide VIS translations, whoops, in more than 40, lang up to 40 languages for VISs, two and a half million downloads. So if you have patients who don't speak English, this is a place to go for VIS translations. And then finally, Ask the Experts is uh, a collection of a thousand technical, more than a thousand technical questions about how to vaccine, how to vaccinate, how to administer vaccines, where in the arm you give them, and then uh, distinct information about each of the vaccines. So uh, this is a highly visited uh, technical part of immunize.org, which is extremely popular. Next slide. So now I'm going to switch gears and let's talk about what's been going on with immunization coalitions over the years. The very So there have been coalitions, Betty Bumpers and Rosalind Carter were forming coalitions back in the early 1990s. So they predated all of what I'm going to talk to you about. They are the founders of Every Child by Two. They did fabulous work and they were really the leaders in kind of getting local coalitions working to vaccinate children after the measles epidemic of 1990. So, but the first coalition conference where all the coalitions came together was in 1998. And we've been meeting together as coalitions every year or every other year since that time. In 2001, there were 225 immunization coalitions. Not all of them got together. Um, there are only about 135 today, but they're very active. And um, a lot of them are very active and powerful. Um, they have different scopes of what they work within, local, state, regional. In 2004, your state hosted the National Conference on Immunization Coalitions. It was hosted by Project Immunize Virginia. Your state has a long history of being a leader among the immunization coalitions of the United States. Dr. Frances Butterfoss, I can't talk about Virginia without talking about her. She was your leader from your state back then, and she was really considered the godmother of immunization coalitions. I would say along with Betty Bumper and Rosalind Carter, because she did so much to inspire us and to spur on immunization coalitions, and she continued to do that. And she continues to do that um, for, um, and she's been doing it for many years. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. And we can probably, um, not talk about this. I just wanted to say back in 2001, we co compiled all the coalitions on a website and that was what it looked like. So that was 20 years ago. Let's go to the next slide, great. So you asked me to talk about, Rebecca asked me to talk about the landscape, what are coalitions doing now? And as a matter of fact, back in 2012, so eight years ago, we conducted, IAC conducted a survey of the 225 existing coalitions and asked them, how their coalition work, what their structures were, what their activities are. And really a lot of this hasn't changed that much. So I'm just going to pull out some of the salient things that I thought would be of interest to you. We had 137 coalitions who completed the survey. And um, let's go forward and see what these coalitions said back then. Geographic borders. Back then, 37% of the coalitions were county coalitions, 20% were state. I think since then, most many co county coalitions have disappeared, and um, and now the states are becoming a much more visible coalitions. I would say. Uh, next slide. And these are the age ranges. So most coalitions back then worked across the age span, and I'd say they still do today. Next slide. So we asked about their educational activities, their vaccination services, their advocacy activities, and their lobbying. Next slide. And this is what they said. And I'm not going to, you, ha, you ha, will have a copy of my slides as a PDF, so you can have all this information, but all, almost all the coalitions work on educating either the public or healthcare professionals, and they continue to do that. Next slide. Um, delivering vaccination services, I think that's less now than it used to be. 
Um, back when we had a lot more flu mist, there were a lot more activities in schools. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of advocacy activities, so advocacy was is really defined as speaking up on behalf of vaccines. So as you can see, and this is speaking up to legislators is what we were talking about. It's not exactly, it's not lobbying, it's just bringing information to legislators, either at the local, the state, or the national level. And 45% back then said they didn't do it, but I'd say now most coalitions do advocacy. Next slide. And then lobbying. Lobbying is really, you know, I don't want to get into the definition of lobbying, but there are coalitions that are doing lobbying, trying to influence legislation, and also just working on improving the legislation in their states. So, and I wanted to say that it's really important that coalitions work closely with their state health officials. I mean, that's really their state health department, their immunization program. We see that. We think it's really important. And the coalitions all, you know, pride themselves on working with their state officials, their state immunization people, and the Association of Immunization Managers, which is the the national organization, umbrella organization for the state immunization program managers. Next slide. So where does your funding come from? This is what we found back then. I don't think it's that different now, though the percentages may have changed. Next slide. Oh, I'm running out of time. Okay, I'm just keep going. Uh, and who do your members represent? I think this is about the same. You know, we have, you know, all these people participate in immunization coalitions as members. Let's go to the next slide. So around 2016, IAC formed the National Network of Immunization Coalitions. And this formed to give coalitions a chance to opportunity to interact between conferences when we would get together. Next slide. So what does the National Network of, this is our website. This is what the National Network does. We have a website in which all of the coalitions who have registered are defined. They'll have a page describing each of their activities. We have an email newsletter that goes out once a month approximately to all the coalition members plus member anyone who signs up for it. We also have a closed email discussion group where you can sign up and be part participating in a, in a group discussion about whatever topic you bring up as a problem within your coalition. We also have nonprofit immunization groups that are uh, connected, families fighting flu, uh, vaccinate your family. I mean, all of us work so hard on immunization. We're all part of this communication network. We have a monthly coalition director calls and nonprofit leaders. So once a month, we have pretty intense phone calls about what's going on right now. Last month's call was um, actually what came up just a couple of weeks ago is the dropping vaccination rates and what we're going to do about that um, as coalitions. And we have a subcommittee now working on that. And let's go to the next slide. This is where you sign up for all of these services. Just go to lisa.jacques at immunize.org. And the next slide. This is an image of what it looks like on the coalition website. You can see you can search by state. There's a box that you can fill in or you can put in a coalition's name or part of its name and hit the search button and all the coalitions in a particular state will pop up or um, your coalition in particular. Next slide. And this is an example of what a page looks like for, for a coalition. This is Indiana's. Next slide. And this is my final slide. And these are just what I'm what what's listed on this slide are some of the things that are going on with the coalitions right now. And some of them are general things. So one of the big hot topics lately is working collaboratively to eliminate personal belief and religious exemptions from um, from school for school entry. So as you know, California, New York, and Maine have now also got, uh, they've eliminated personal belief and religious exemptions from their, you know, from their immunization requirements. So we're really fortunate that five states now only allow medical exemptions. So that's a hot topic and it's being worked on on several states. Also, and legislators are under attack by anti-vaccination activists. So some states coalitions are helping with that. 
Of course, coalitions are always educating the public about the value of vaccines and partnering with state immunization staff, as I mentioned, and collaborating and communicating with among their coalition, within their coalition, and among the coalition network and with national immunization stakeholders. Um, my bottom line on this is that each, each coalition really evaluates the issues that exist in their state and they figure out from there you know, what they need to focus on. And in summary, uh, all of us at IAC and everyone within the national network of immunization coalitions looks forward to working with all of you in the Virginia Immunization Coalition uh, to support the work that uh, that you are working to achieve. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wexler. And I'll pass it to Katie to monitor any questions that we may have received during the presentation. Uh, we haven't received any questions yet, but if you have a question, please feel free to put it into the chat, or we do have the actual questions feature that you can type into. So we can wait and see if anyone has a question they'd like to ask right now. Okay. In the meantime, you'll just see me transitioning slides. Okay. All right, well, to stay on schedule, um, if, if questions do arise, so much good information and, and Dr. Wexler is such a valuable source of information for coalitions. So again, we're so lucky to have had you on the call today. And if questions arise, we can certainly take those at the end. Um, but to stay on schedule, I can um, transition us to our next speaker. Um, we have, oh, uh, let me just quickly fix the sharing. I do apologize. Thank you for your patience with the um, technical difficulties here. I'll have that up in a moment, but let me first introduce, introduce um, Erica Henley. She is our, an immunization data manager at the Division of Immunization um, within the Virginia Department of Health. Erica Henley, um, is the immunization data manager for the <laughs> Division of Immunizations with NVDH. She coordinates state immunization surveys, conducts data analysis, and calculates immunization coverage and exemption rates for Virginia. She has a bachelor's degree in health science from James Madison University, a master's degree in public health from Liberty University, and is currently a PhD student who expects to complete her dissertation in investigating the barriers affecting HPV vaccination uptake among adolescents. Erica has a passion for immunizations and is a vital contribution to public health and the prevention of vaccine preventable diseases. She's also a mother of three and enjoys spending her time with family and learning new things. We are so grateful to have you on the call with us today. I am going to pass the controls to you, Erica, and within one moment, I will um, have your presentation back up on the screen. I appreciate your patience as we just transition here. Okay. All right, Erica, you should have control. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. And thank you so much, Dr. Wexler, for that uh, presentation. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Virginia's immunization uh, climate right now. Um, as Rebecca stated, I am the immunization data manager. Um, so I do a lot with data and it's data is very important it tells us a story so um, being able to share this data with you so that you can visually see um, how virginia is looking in terms of immunization uh, coverage rates as well as um, religious exemptions I'll advance this for you if it's not working. Okay, thank you. Thanks, bye. Okay, so today, again, I will be talking uh, with you all about immunization data in general, um, influenza data in Virginia, uh, current statewide initiatives and programs, strategic goals, strategic guidance, and the needs and challenges that we're faced with um, here in Virginia. 
so here we have compliance data. Um, we have a line graph and a bar graph that's basically the same information, but it just shows it uh, in two different ways. So at the with the line graph, you see that kindergarten compliance data is um, illustrated as green and middle school compliance data is illustrated as blue. So when we're looking at compliance, we're generally looking at a specific vaccine series. Um, at a, at a certain point in time, so as of the first day of school. So for combined kindergarten, and when I say combined, I mean private and public schools, um, we're looking for the 44232 series, um, and that's four DTAPs, four polios or up-to-date polio, uh, two MMR, three Hep B, and two varicellas. And for combined middle schools, and that's private and uh, public, specifically sixth grade um, middle school data, we're looking for three two, the 3212 uh, series at school entry. So that is three hepatitis B doses, two MMR doses, one Tdap dose, and two varicella doses. So looking at the line graph, we can see that from school year 2016 to school year 2017, there was a slight decrease in immunization compliance rates for both combined kindergarten and combined middle schools. So if we take a look at the bar graph, we can see that the compliance rate in school year 2016 was 84% for kindergarten, and it dropped down to 83.6% in 2017. Um, and for the middle school, um, we have in 2016, a compliance rate of 85.1%, and that dropped down to 82.6% in school year 2017. We did increase um, fo the following year in, in school year 2018. Uh, for kindergarten, we went from 83.6 to 85.6, and for middle school, we went from 82.6 in school year 2017 to 84.9 in 2018. Next slide. Okay, uh, so now I wanted to take a look at the Virginia religious exemption data. Um, so as you can see here, I've separated out uh, the public kindergarten and public uh, and private kindergarten uh, data. So um, for kindergarten, we see that the green is um, indicative of the public kindergarten sector. So in 2016, uh, we see there was a slight decrease for public kindergartens. However, in the private in the private area, we went up significantly from 1.38% to 2.41%. Um, and in terms of the public and private sixth grade, we went from uh, 0 0.75 for public six to 1% um, from school year 2016 to 2017. And for the private, we actually um, went up, up, sorry, went down from 1.31% to 1.23%. Um, but as you can see in school year 2018, we did go up for both. Um, public and private. So I did want to show this uh, this graph as well so that you can kind of see um, um, in, in school year 2016 and 2017 that there, there was a significant jump in religious exemptions, which could be contributed, contributing to the decrease in compliance rates during that time period. I'm sorry. Uh, next slide, thank you. So the Virginia influenza vaccination coverage rate, um, we're particularly interested in the age group of five to 18 years of age and adults. So um, as you can see um, with the blue circle here or oval, um, we are not at our Healthy People 2020 goal of 80%. Uh, so this will definitely be an area that we wanna focus on. Um, for uh, influenza coverage rates, we wanna be able to increase those rates so that we can meet that goal and hopefully eventually um, exceed that goal. That goal. Um, for that. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I think we're both controlling. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, so, um, so for our statewide initiatives, right now we are, um, we are we do have a hepatitis A vaccination campaign, and this came about uh, due to the hepatitis A outbreak across the country. Um, we did um, have 
at one point, some of the states bordering Virginia were having outbreaks. So in order to get ahead of the outbreak, the hepatitis A vaccination campaign came about. So the purpose was to increase vaccination in adult populations at high risk. So these are individuals who are drug users, uh, homeless individuals, men who have sex with men, and those who are incarcerated or recently incarcerated individuals. So the objectives were to, to increase the amount of overall hepatitis A doses administered by health districts to adults. Um, and also each health district uh, was to host or partner in, an, in at least one vaccination event outside of normal clinical operations. So um, we did have some health districts, they went into the prisons to vaccinate, or they went into the homeless shelters to vaccinate uh, those at high, highest risk. So in terms of funding, um, there are state and chargeable funding uh, sources that are available for this initiative. So any type of barrier, to vaccination, um, we would provide those vaccines uh, at no cost. In terms of reporting, uh, for accountability purposes, the districts do submit a quarterly hepatitis A vaccination report. I um, mean, it's also to get an idea of how many vaccines are being used. Um, and at this time, this campaign is on ongoing. Um, I believe we're still seeing cases at this time. Uh, so there is no end date, um, but this is uh, the, the current initiative that we are doing at the moment. Okay, next slide. Okay, I think that's me. Okay, uh, so in terms of misinformation, this is very important. Um, so vaccine hesitancy uh, is, is a major contributor to uh, lack of vaccine. Um, so we have the anti-vax movement, which is a very powerful uh, group of individuals, um, and they are they spread uh, misinformation. And you know, with social media, they have a bigger platform to be able to do that, um, along with word of mouth as well. We also know that um, there have been claims that autism. Um, are a result of vac vaccination. However, there have been many studies that have debunked this claim, um, but there is still a stigma surrounding autism and vaccines. And also the misconception that adults um, have in terms of vaccines. Uh, many may feel that vaccines are just for children and that's really not the case. And we wanna be able to um, educate adults and let them know that you know there are vaccinations for for them as well and we want to be able to protect them um, against any vaccine preventable disease if we can do so okay okay so our our current uh, statewide programs that we have um, the Vax Virginia vaccines for children program and the Virginia vaccines for adults program uh, both are managed by the Virginia Department of Health uh, within the division of immunizations um, the VVFC program, which is Virginia Vaccines for Children, is a national program that was established to help raise childhood immunization rates in the United States um, while keeping children in their medical home. Um, the VVFC program it currently has 700 facilities um, that are enrolled in the program. Uh, DOI, also known as Division of Immunization, supplies federally and state purchase vaccines at no cost to public and private uh, health care providers. So with COVID-19, um, typically VFC um, would go into the health districts, into the private providers um, to conduct site visits uh, to, to make sure, you know, protocols and, and requirements were being followed. Um, but due to COVID-19, they are unable to make site visits at this, at this time. So working with CDC, um, they've received guidance for remote storage and handling uh, spot checks, as well as uh, ensuring providers are up to date on their annual training uh, requirements. In terms of VVFA, um, this particular program assists with uh, those adults who may have barriers to um, 
to vaccinations, are unable to afford uh, vaccinations or have no insurance. Uh, DOI supplies federally and state purchase vaccines at no cost for this program as well. Um, there are currently 57 adult-only providers, so this number does not include providers who serve both children and adults. Again, with COVID-19, um, we are unable to conduct in-person site visits, so working with CDC, um, the BBFA program is, is currently offering uh, remote technical assistance and guidance for storage and handling. Um, so additional programs that we have, the Immunization Quality Improvement for Providers Program, also known as IQIP. Uh, it's a national level quality improvement program that assesses clinical workflow to improve quality of immunization services and vaccine uptake. Um, as a result of COVID-19, coverage rates have been affected negatively. Um, so the program is working with CDC to determine guidance to be able to increase uh, childhood and adolescent immunizations and catch-up schedules because we know there are going to be some issues um, once the stay-at-home orders are lifted and trying to get uh, the children and adolescents vaccinated. Um, we want to be able to protect them from um, infectious and vaccine preventable diseases. Um, so work, IQIP will be working with CDC to determine how best to do that. Um, so IQIP is also unable at this time to perform visits. Um, however, they are conducting check-ins um, with those uh, facilities that were um, that did have an in-person visit prior to the suspension. Um, and the check-ins are conducted at two months, six months, and 12 months following the initial adequate visit. Um, we also are targeting adolescent vaccinations. So we do have the Virginia HPV Immunization Task Force, also known as VHIT. And the purpose of this task force is to assemble stakeholders throughout the state um, to partner together to reduce uh, the risk of HPV-associated cancers through education, uh, preventative services, and evidence-based interventions. Uh, this particular task force is co-led by the American Cancer Society, um, and I believe that they meet quarterly um, to discuss ways to um, educate um, on HPV and um, HPV-associated cancers. They, we also have the Someone You Love viewings, which is a very powerful documentary. Um, it's used to engage the public about HPV vaccination as a means of cancer prevention. So it follows um, individuals um, and their stories about HPV and cervical cancer. Um, there is a panel discussion following the viewing of the documentary uh, to talk with experts and dialogue and um, ask questions um, following the viewing as well. So our st strategic goals, the Division of Immunization's mission is the reduction of morbidity and mortality associated with vaccine preventable diseases. So our benchmark, um, where we look to for our goals are Healthy People 2020. Um, I specifically pulled out some goals um, that we look to reach and exceed. So the first goal is to achieve and maintain effective vaccination coverage levels for universally recommended vaccines among young children. And that target percentage is 90%. Um, the goal of increasing the percentage of children aged 19 to 35 months who receive the recommended doses of DTaP, polio, MMR, Hib, hepatitis B, varicella, and pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, and that target is 80%. And we also um, we also um, try to reach the goal of increasing routine vaccination coverage levels for adolescents, and this includes HPV vaccination, and that target is 80%. Um, so this is the the guide for us, and we want to be able to reach these goals and exceed these goals and protect as many uh, children, adolescents, and adults uh, that we can. Um, also, I wanted to talk a little bit about House Bill 1090. Um, so this bill was was introduced at the most recent uh, General Assembly session. Um, it amends the minimum vaccination requirement. This was not an administration bill that VDH sponsored. However, we will be implementing it as it was um, approved. It will be effective uh, July 1st, 2021. So not this, not this 
um, upcoming school year, but the following school year it will um, go into effect. So the updates to um, the immunization vaccination requirements are HPV vaccines. It went from three doses to two doses, and it's for both males and females. Uh, rotavirus vaccine, two or three doses, depending on the manufacturer, um, and that's for children up to eight months of age. Uh, hepatitis A vaccine, two doses of um, that vaccination, and the meningococcal conjugate vaccine, uh, two doses, and the first prior to seventh grade and the second prior to 12th grade. Um, so the needs and challenges that we're that we are facing. So uh, recently, um, in, in the May 8th MMWR, uh, we were um, advised that vaccine ordering is down nationally. Um, so this is definitely um, going to relate to vaccine administration being down as well for for children and teens. So we want to be able to coordinate with providers. Um, and, and schools for catch-up vaccination. So with COVID-19 uh, still happening and it being a very fluid uh, situation, we don't really have a lot of details of how the school year is going to, um, vaccines required for school entry is going to be affected at this time, but we do know that vaccine administration is down, so there will be um, some, some, some effect on that. Um, also the logistics of COVID-19, so um, identifying the the vaccine administration procedures due to COVID-19 um, and how we're going to be able to, um, to vaccinate the population um, prior to school entry. Right now we are prioritizing children um, two years and younger, 24 months of age and younger. But once the stay at home um, orders are lifted and we have children that um, have to go back to school and are required to have specific vaccines, we need to be able to identify the administration procedures um, at that point. So addressing barriers to immunizations as well. In terms of um, health, sorry, House Bill 1090, uh, getting the education out to the parents for the next school year is going to be very important as well. Um, um, there's going to be a big push for that um, because it may be a little confusing. Um, so we want to be able to get that information out as well. So we may, be we may have to coordinate with the Department of Education to do that. Also vaccine misinformation. So um, in the previous slide, um, we're talking about anti-vax and um, autism. We want to be able to dispel vaccination misinformation and educate the public with facts and scientific evidence that backs uh, vaccination. And lastly, we want to increase influenza vaccination in the 5 to 18 year age group and in adults. So being able to um, promote the influenza vaccine um, and to increase our rates in that area are um, is a huge need and a, and a huge challenge for us here in Virginia. Um, so that's it for me and I'll pass it back to Rebecca and Katie for questions. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Erica. I know you've answered so many questions that um, I've, I've spoken with people about they're interested in knowing. So I will let Katie talk, uh, moderate the Q&A if any questions have come in. Sure, we've had quite a few. And um, I would say that these questions probably go to both of you. So feel free to unmute and whoever wants to answer. Um, this one, Erica, I think is to you. Do we know what, uh, sorry, how do you track children that are homeschooled? Uh, so we don't track home, um, children who are homeschooled currently. Um, we just don't have the means to do that right now. Um, I know that we do want to, um, but just at the moment, we, we don't look into um, homeschool children. And do we know why there was such an increase in 2017? Um, we don't know. Um, the only, I mean, looking at the data, we can say that religious exemptions did have, did play a part in that. Um, but it, we just, we don't know why exactly there was an increase in, in that time period. Okay. There are quite a few questions coming after each other, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, are the exemptions from the whole schedule or just a selection of the schedule? Uh, do we have religious exemptions coming from families choosing only a segment of the schedule? So this religious exemptions that the we capture if they have a religious exemption, regardless if it's to one particular vaccine or to all vaccines, we don't 
separate them out. We don't um, just say uh, this is these religious exemptions are just dependent on if a child had no vaccine, they're completely um, exempt um, due to a religion. So it's if they've ever reported having one, even if they've been vaccinated, we still include that in that rate. Okay. Um, and I'm sure this question can be for either of you. Is there a site that gives references for debunking the information being espoused by anti-vax group so that we can be informed and better prepared when information um, being stated that's wrong. So when there's misinformation going around. Mm. I can start with that. Um, I think there are, can you hear me okay? Um, yes. If you use the vaccine educate, well, first of all, immunize.org has a section called vaccine confidence handouts. So we have a lot of information on our website there. So printed materials. We have a section called talking about vaccines. You know, if you look at across our navigation, I don't know if Rebecca, you have, can pull that up or not, but you can click down and then we'll talk about religious issues, uh, adjuvants, um, additives, vaccine safety, importance of vaccines, too many, too soon, you can go there. But, you know, in terms of, um, and then Vaxopedia is a really great place to find um, information debunked which is a, a blog by a doctor, pediatrician in Louisiana, I believe, Dr. Vince Ionelli. And finally, I'd like to mention Voices for Vaccines, which has a weekly newsletter called Vaccine Hesitancy. So this is a parent-run organization that educates the public and parents about vaccine safety. And it's a great organization, and I urge everybody to just go and sign up. It's free, voicesforvaccines.org, and it's F-O-R, not the number four. And I would add to that, I'm going to speak in my presentation a little bit about the Immunize VA website we're launching, which links to many of IAC's resources that um, were just referenced. I also have included some handouts in this webinar. So on your kind of control panel, you should have an option to look at different handouts. One of them is um, an IAC page that kind of outlines different ways to access these resources, if that's correct, Dr. Wexler. That was the handout you had sent me prior. The handout was more about the coalitions. So okay. that, that's not, that wasn't that, but. Okay. We have a couple of handouts like that too. That handout is available here, but we also again have some of that information linked in our website. May I ask a question of Erica? Sure. Erica, how do you enact, how do you, um, when you say, how do people get exempted from uh, religious exemptions? Do they just write a letter or how do they say, I have a religious refusal of vaccines? Basically, so that, that was a question. <laughs> okay, yeah. so we have a form on our website and it's basically a form that they sign and they get notarized saying that their religious tenants um, do not agree with vaccination and they fill that out, they get it uh, notarized and that's basically it. That's all they okay. have to do. Do they do it every year or once once in a lifetime? It's only once. It follows them. Yes. Now, if they decide to to vaccinate their children, that's they can do that as well. But if they have a religious exemption on file, then it's it's only once. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. I think we're cutting close on time. So, do do we have time for one more question? Sure. Let's do one more, and then I'll take over for the last bit. Okay, that sounds great. Um, so I think in regard to catch up vaccines after the pandemic, would part of the plan be to go into schools to vaccinate or possibly use a mobile van? Um, so we don't know at this point, um, and, and I'm sorry that I don't have a, a, a answer at this at this time, but with this with the situation happening, we just don't know when, we're going to be able to open everything up to the point where you know vaccination can happen. So we're still just monitoring and and trying to navigate um, right now. And at this at this point in time, we just don't know at the moment. Okay. Thank you so much. And can I say something about that too, Katie? Because CDC just talked about that this morning, and they're talking about it right now. And they are urging parents to call their doctor's offices to figure out what are the parent, what are the clinics doing? And I don't know what's going on in Virginia, but nationally, 
CDC is encouraging people to please call your doctor's office and figure out how you can safely be vaccinated because providers' offices need their patients there and they're creating safe mechanisms for children getting vaccinated. And across the age span, of course, we want to prioritize the youngest children, but everybody needs vaccines. So um, the most important message is call your doctor's office to find out what they're doing and when you can safely bring your children in. Thank you. And for everyone else who submitted a question, um, we'll save those questions and see if we can maybe in a follow-up send out a response to some or maybe some resources that will address them. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Katie. And in the off chance we have a few moments, we're happy to spend an extra few minutes, um, at least I am, to answer any questions that I can. I did just want to end the webinar today talking a little bit more about our specific coalitions and our plans. We've been really busy at work and I'm really excited to share some of the things with you that we've worked on so far. I'm gonna try not to talk too fast um, and get through as much as I can, but I do talk fast when I'm excited. My name is Rebecca. I am a program manager at the Institute for Public Health Innovation. I am going to be managing the coalition. Um, this is a project that we have received support from the Virginia Department of Health for. Um, and I want to take a, just a few moments to introduce the Institute for Public Health Innovation. I know for some, this is the first time you're hearing from us. We are more than one of 40 public health institutes across the country and a member of the National Network of Public Health Institutes. Public health institutes have a unique and important role in their states and in their communities um, because of their ability to serve as a cross-cutting nonprofit resource organization that works in collaboration with a broad range of partners to improve community health. And I'm hoping you can't hear my pets, but I'll just continue on. Okay, IPHI is unique in that we serve a regional, we have a regional scope. Most um, public health institutes are state-based. We were launched in 2009 to serve the Virginia, Maryland, and DC area. Our mission is to build partnerships across sectors and cultivate innovative solutions to improve health and well-being for all people and communities throughout the DMV region, particularly those most affected by health inequities. We do have a broad mission that encompasses a diverse portfolio of public health activities. We typically work at a systems level by forging cross-sector partnerships, developing the health workforce and pursuing policy improvements and leading collaborative approaches that improve service systems and test new healthcare approaches. This is just a brief snapshot to illustrate our capacity um, as a backbone agency. These are a few projects we've worked on across the region. In each of these projects, we've served as a neutral facilitative partner working across sectors to convene diverse public health advocates to work together in pursuit of common goals. Just want to introduce the IPHI team that will be working on the coalition. Dr. Mike Royster is IPHI's vice president and will provide general oversight and strategic guidance on the coalition. You've already met Katie Pecarella. She's an assistant program manager and is supporting various program aspects of the coalition. And of course, there's me. Again, I'm Rebecca and I'm serving as the program manager for the coalition. I'll serve as the main point of contact and will manage day-to-day -day implementation activities. I'd also like to briefly recognize our summer in intern from the University of Richmond, Marissa Goodall. She's already been immensely helpful in the short time she's been with us and will continue to support coalition activities this summer. As we begin talking about the coalition, I think we really first need to acknowledge Project Immunize Virginia. Dr. Wexler already touched on this, but they were the statewide immunization coalition in Virginia that was active from 1995 to 2012. And again, echoing what Dr. Wexler said, it's safe to say they truly were a pioneer in the statewide immunization coalition landscape. Their mission was to ensure that all Virginians were appropriately immunized through linking immunization providers, families, and community coalitions to technical support, education, and community resources. The coalition was comprised of approximately 200 cross-sector and diverse members and was supported by the Division of Immunizations at VDH, EVMS, and other local foundation pharmaceutical companies. Just a few of their most notable accomplishments were public health awareness campaigns, the creation of birth cards to help new parents track immunizations, office-based education programs for providers, 
the creation of local immunization coalitions and partnerships, and promoting some essential programs we still operate today, including VVFC and the immunization registry programs. As an active coalition for nearly 20 years, these, these few bullet points really don't do their accomplishments justice. If we were in a room today, as we originally planned to be, this is the point where I'd ask all of the former PIV members who are with us today to stand so we could applaud you for what you, the work that you've accomplished, but hopefully we'll be able to do that soon. In the meantime, um, we just want to acknowledge again the foundation that PIV laid for us to start today. However, we are in a new era and moving into 2020, a lot have changed, changed and new needs have emerged. In 2019, the World Health Organization named vaccine hesitancy as one of the top 10 global health threats. Additionally, as we've heard from other presentations, there are persistent health inequities related to accessing preventative care that prevent people from accessing immunizations. Barriers like transportation, employment, and income still prevent people from accessing vaccines. There's also new legislation moving through the General Assembly. As Erica mentioned, it's going to create a ripple effect of changes across the state. Um, and now keep in mind that I originally developed this slide for a meeting in March, and since then, more has changed than any of us could have imagined with the COVID-19 pandemic and only further emphasizes the importance of immunizations and a strong coordinated public health approach. In preparing to in evaluating the feasibility for this study, for this coalition, the Division of Immunizations conducted a stakeholder survey. They had 344 responses total. Over three quarter of the respondents had clinical roles with 9% having participated in the former coalition. Um, nearly 80% said they were interested in seeing an immunization coalition established in Virginia again, and 63.6% said they were interested in participating in the coalition. They were also asked to rank um, the following focus areas for the coalition from highest to lowest interest. Education was ranked the highest, followed by advocacy, quality improvement, partnerships, and capacity building. We also conducted a stakeholder survey. Many of you completed it when you registered for our in-person meeting, and others who couldn't attend the meeting participated in it through an online survey. Most were, were health service providers. Others included nonprofits, individuals from nonprofits, federal and state agencies, pharmaceutical companies, and university or primary school health systems. The majority of respondents had a statewide reach. Others had a good number had central, a reach in central Virginia and eastern Virginia. We also had participants from the northern region, the northwest region, and the southwest region. We had a total of 114 participants. I think we're going to skip the poll for the sake of time. Um, I just want to highlight a, a really brief summary of what we found from this survey. I will go into greater depth in our, in, in our following series of webinars we'll be hosting this summer. We asked respondents to talk about the greatest barriers to achieving optimal immunization rates. By and large, misinformation was the top contributor. That was parents or individuals having false or incorrect information about vaccines. Following closely behind was a lack of information, which was parents who didn't have information about when they needed vaccines, what vaccines were needed, what follow-up was needed, or what resources were available for them to get them. Other significant issues were access, particularly in rural and Im immigrant communities. Um, there were also policy and system issues identified. Factors that promoted optimal immunization rates were wide, so I've really only included the most popular or the most common responses. Those were insurance coverage, programs like VVFC, VVFA, strong communication and education efforts that exist that we can capitalize on, the school requirements for vaccines, and cross-sector collaborations. Some needs that were listed were professional education, and that was a pretty significant finding. Um, a lot of people referenced the need for CEUs, um, as well as increased outreach and community education, a media campaign to combat the anti-vax movement, enhanced data collection and surveillance across the state, and improved access to vaccines. Finally, there were several resources listed to or identified to, that would help the coalition achieve their goals. 
partnerships were a strong resource. And I'll give a little shout out to our statewide HPV task force, BHINT, because they were repeatedly referenced as a great resource to capitalize upon. Um, commitment engagement of individuals who are leaders in this field and who have been doing the work for years, their track record and that commitment was also listed as a significant asset that we have. Others included the surveillance tools, um, other free and low cost vaccine programs and education materials and campaigns that already exist. I know I've gone a little bit over, so I'm just going to move through this and we will send out these slides at the, um, after the, following this webinar. Compiling all of this information, we had four priority areas, community outreach and education, quality management, professional education and advocacy. We plan to create work groups surrounding each of these priority areas moving forward. We've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes to prepare for the launch of the coalition, including drafting a mission statement. Um, our vision is simple. It is that a few, as a future where the quality and length of Virginians' lives are not impacted by a disease that could have been prevented by immunization. Our mission mirrors that of other statewide coalitions, and that is to protect the health and well-being of all Virginians by achieving and maintaining full immunization protection through education, advocacy, statewide collaboration, and the promotion of equity. We, you, please feel free to add any comments or chats um, in the chat box now or follow up with me via email if you have thoughts or comments about the statement or the goals I'm about to share. Once we have formed a strategic planning committee, they will work on tailoring all of these and refining all of these um, documents we've drafted as well as developing a strategic plan. Our goals respond directly to the needs our stakeholders identified um, through interviews and surveys. They span across all of our priority areas I mentioned. Um, we also looked at the goals of other coalitions and the former Virginia coalition to develop these. Um, we also were intentional about including equity in our goals as our vision fundamentally relates to equitable access to vaccines for all. Many of the barriers and needs that stakeholders reported in the surveys related directly to underlying equity issues, so we felt that was a really important piece to include. Our goals related to disseminating science-based information, providing educational opportunities for healthcare professionals, raising immunization levels, advocating for policies that promote sensible approaches to disease prevention, improving immunization data collection, and um, fostering cross-sector partnerships. Moving through this quick, but I will send this information out and some of it is available as a handout. I'm really excited to share our website. That's another key resource that we developed in preparation for the launch. And I also want to give a shout out to Jessica McKee, a former student at George Mason, recent graduate who helped us compile the information for the website. Um, this website is meant to provide information about the coalition, science-based resources on immunizations, but it will also serve as a hub for information and collaboration for members through a member-only portal. Portal, Based on the experience other coalitions have had with the anti-vax community, we've taken certain precautions into consideration. So the portal will be password protected and available only to members. I'll continue to review a few of these key resources in the portal throughout the presentation, but first wanted to point out that you may have noticed we have two logos visible on this slide. We were hoping to um, vote, and I know we're over time, but I'm still going to quickly launch this poll. These are the two options, and we were hoping that, to get feedback from attendees today on which one you prefer. So I am going to launch a poll. Once I launch it, you will not see these logo options anymore. So please take one, one quick moment to decide which one you like. And I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. Okay, that should be showing up momentarily. Okay, we're not seeing it. Um, okay, you should see it now. Don't want to spend too much time on this, but you should hopefully see it now. I will just give you a few seconds. Again, I know we've, we've run over our allotted time. Okay, I'm going to give that 10 more seconds. Looks like all of our answers are coming in. So thank you so much for everyone who voted. Oh, a few more coming in. And it looks like we have a clear winner here. So number two, it is. We will update our website 
after um, after this webinar, and we will go with option number two. Thank you to all who voted. Okay, moving right along. Um, so this is where we're moving, for, what, what we're planning on for the coalition moving forward. First, we need to recruit members. We need to form our steering committee and work groups. We need to develop a strategic plan and then put that plan into action. Step one with recruiting members. Um, in the handouts, we have included the member agreement. Uh, all of, we are asking our members to review and submit a member agreement to become an official member of the coalition. The document, um, not, in a nutshell, outlines the how we will interact together, um, that it states that members will advance the coalition together, um, that we will support coalition efforts, promote the coalition as a trusted resource of information. Um, it talks about the benefits. The membership is free and there are multiple benefits for members. Among others, they include the ability to contribute to our plan, um, nominate, participate and vote in the steering committee, um, receive early registration, things like that. We fully expect members to engage with each other thoughtfully, but we have also included a code of conduct to help start um, forming norms and ground rules for interacting with one another. Finally, I'll mention membership is renewed annually, but to keep things um, streamlined, we'll just auto renew that for you, but have that give you the option to opt out at any time. So how do you join? Through our website. So on our website, immunizevirginia.org, you'll notice um, a member a, a button that says members that will take you to our member page and there you'll ask to either sign up or log in. You'll click sign up. That will take you to the form. Go ahead and fill that out, submit it. All forms will be reviewed and approved. Again, membership is free and open to anyone who supports our mission. This process is really just to ensure that everyone who submits the form is an actual person. And then we'll also keep an eye out for anything that seems fishy. For example, someone with known ties to disruptive anti-vax groups. Once approved, we um, you will gain access to the portal where, portal where we have a directory, a resource library, a discussion forum, and a space for work groups to collaborate. There are a lot of interactive tools, um, and I will hope to, to have another opportunity to share them in person, but please feel free to take a look at those um, and submit a membership form today. I will also send all of this information in a follow-up email after the webinar. I also want to talk about forming the steering committee. We have seven positions available, chair, vice chair, secretary, and work group leaders in each of our priority areas. The strategic, um, the steering committee will be instrumental in forming our strategic plan. So it's a really exciting time to consider joining. We'll ask, we will be accepting nominations starting today through June 30th. Um, we'll review all nominations, primarily reviewing nominations to ensure that interested individuals do not have a significant conflict of interest in which they are individually or professionally positioned to financially benefit from promoting vaccines. To submit, again, it's open, nominations are open now. Um, the form is in the member portal. I will again send a follow-up email with all this information. Um, we just ask you that if you are nominating somebody, you make sure that they are aware that they're being nominated first. You are also welcome to nominate yourself. And again, I will send more information in a follow-up email because I know I'm going through this quickly. Last, once we have that steering committee, we will make a plan, we'll put it into action. So my call to action to you today, please submit the member agreement online, nominate yourself or someone else for the steering committee and attend one of our forums we have planned this summer. They will be participatory forums. We will have um, private rooms in the online setting where you can go to discuss our strategic plan for in each of these areas moving forward. Um, the links for these will be will be emailed to you after the webinar and are available on our website. I am so sorry for going over, but that is all I have for you today. Okay. Um, I, I'm happy to stay on if anyone has questions for me, Katie, but otherwise I thank you all so much for joining. I know that we've gone over. I appreciate it and I'm so excited to get the coalition up and running. Okay. All right. Um, you are on mute, Katie. Sorry. Um, I was just going to say that that it doesn't look like we have any uh, questions right now about that. Okay. 
All right, well, I think then we can end the webinar. Thank you so much again, um, Deborah and Erica, for presenting today. It was so wonderful to have you, and I look forward to working with everyone on the coalition this spring and summer, and hopefully seeing you on one of our upcoming web forums. All right, thank you. Thank Thanks you. So Bye. Bye.